Sometimes I think guys like Cecil Payne, you know, Cecil's such a great baritone player. I used to have all his records back in Britain. I think, hey, these guys used to be my heroes. Now they're my friends. We gotta go into Zabar's because okay. we need to get some, some cheese and a little bit of lox and maybe some of that nice cream cheese. Okay, but let's not buy too many things because you're not gonna be home for the weekend. I came to live in New York at the end of 1965. I'd been to the States before, of course, with Humphrey. Humphrey Littleton for the Newport Jazz Festival in 1959, and I'd always had a hankering to come back. Still with no smoked cheese, still with nitrate. Forget it temporarily, forget it. Let's get 
Oh, we have to get some. Uh, it's like you make a reputation, be it in Scotland, or Britain, or Europe, and there comes a time you've got to measure it against the best, and that means New York. Like this is awful. This is good. This, this is, is great. A nice one. You leave that's that out overnight. That's a good one. That's ready now. At first, I thought that every musician in New York City was an absolute killer, dynamite. But pretty soon, I discovered that the thing about New York is, it's got the worst as well as the best of everything, musicians included. I've been with Woody Herman, Thad Jones, and Mel Lewis, Clark Terry, Mingus, the Ellington Band, and of course, one of my all-time greats. Buck Clayton. Oh, 
Milt Hinton is known as the judge. That says a lot about Milt and a lot about jazz. I mean, history is very important to jazz. And Milt, well, he's had them all and played with most of them. Taken wonderful photographs of most of them, too. How did you, uh, I mean, how did you come about the start of your professional career? From Chicago, you... Well, I saw Al Capone open up this nightclub in Chicago, in Chicago, and now that the theaters are all closed, Al Jolson had made the first sound movie, The Jazz Singer, and all the violin players are losing their jobs because now we don't need violins in theaters anymore. Oh, the sound is on the screen. Right. See, yeah. so now, and here I'm just ready, 16, 17 years old, ready to play, get in the band, and there's no way. Uh -huh. And I saw all of my peers go to work for Al Capone at this cotton club he had, and he was paying them $75 a week, which was astronomical. That's a lot days. of money, yeah. A lot of money. And, and Al Capone was, a, we looked at him as a Robin Hood. Right. He'd get these, let these guys get cars, he'd just tell the guy, give him a car, and the guy <laughs> have to give you a car. And so, yeah. they would be, I'm still delivering newspapers now, and here these, my friends are driving by me with Ford cars with disc wheels, and they would say to me, why don't you get a horn? And so consequently, I said, hey, maybe I better change. And yeah. I thought it was easy, to, since I'm a string player, to change from, from violin to bass. Right. So I stuck up the bass, faking it first, <laughs> good enough to get a job. And sooner or later, so all the bass players got drunk one night, and there was nobody left. They said, well, get the kid. <laughs> yeah. I got a shot at it. I finally got to be very good at bass. You know, I'm pretty good. And like all young people, I wanted out to do the old guys. So, trying to play things, slap the bass and go go crazy. So yeah. I was getting a lot of work and trying to go to school. And when I got in music history classes, I'd go right to sleep. Yeah. And my teacher, I had a wonderful teacher, a man, man named George Gomer Jones, that had studied in the Royal Academy under Coleridge Taylor. Oh. So he had some kind of sympathy feeling for, for black people because Coleridge Taylor was a black master from the Royal Academy. And he, uh, he saw me sleeping in the history classes and he says, hey, Mr. Hinton, was happening and I told him I had to wait because I had my father right and he said well uh, I, how much are you making I, by that time I had one job making 40 bucks a week in a the theater 60 bucks a week in a the theater and going from 11 o'clock to 4 in the morning in a nightclub mm. making 40 dollars so I was making 100 bucks a week and my teacher says I don't make 100 bucks a week <laughs> at the <laughs> university he said yeah. <laughs> Someone gave me a camera for my birthday, and I'd be with all these wonderful musicians like Chew Bear and Cab Calloway and Doc Cheatham and Ben Webster. I wanted to photograph them. I tried to photograph musicians in their own habitat, right. not like photographers catch us on the bandstand with our horns up. Yeah. I wanted to catch the guys sleep in the buzz and working in some restaurants where we had to eat with the signs back in those days. It's right. told what, what direction we had to go in order to get something to eat and uh -huh. that sort of stuff. And I was documenting them just for my own uh, fun. Sometimes the professional photographers weren't, weren't allowed in the studios because they would be clicking and that would disturb the people. But I was already in there with my camera, so right. I had a chance to get some of these shots. And now to look at some of us old guys like Dizzy when he was a young kid and all of these wonderful people and seeing Billy Holiday on the last recording session, those sort of things, uh, become like a milestone.
Thank you.